began this message at the onset by saying this. The decision to make no judgments is indeed a judgment. Make no judgments. Hear me well and it'll make sense. Is a judgment. One of the athletic chains that's real popular today says a judgment free zone. Come and work out at our gym. We don't judge. But you can tell by their commercials that they do make judgments. If your muscles are big and you're strong and you can lift a whole lot of weights and make noise while you're lifting, they have decided that they don't want you at their gym. That's a judgment. And yet they call the zone a judgment-free zone. I guess that's designed to attract losers who don't want to train hard. And so they say, come here and... Uh, there's no judgments. To judge all actions, all behavior as morally the same. And therefore, make no judgments is indeed a judgment. One of the prevailing phrases in society today is, I don't judge. But I want to tell you, when you say that you do not judge, that's a judgment. That is a decision that you've made to suspend common sense. Or you're being untruthful. Because in reality, you cannot live without making judgments. Ability to judge is the ability to discern, to make distinctions between this and that. Praise the Lord. Between left and right, up and down, right and wrong, in and out. Likes and dislikes. Judgments. Today's message is about priests who concluded that God would be satisfied with whatever we offered him. And uh, therefore, they made a judgment to make no judgments. Amen. They decided that the response we give to him, that we give to God, for what the Lord has done for us would be totally accepted by the Lord no matter what the response. That how we respond to his goodness, whether the response is great or small, God would accept it. Amen. That as long, here's what they decided. As long as you offered God something, that something is better than nothing. Even if that something that you offered him is not your best. They decide that when it comes to God, something is better than nothing, even if that something is not your best. 
God bless you, Brother John, Sister John. They decided that something, when it comes to God, is better than nothing, even if that something is not your best. It never entered their minds that God would rather that they shut the house down opposed to offering him something that is less than their best. The reason I gave a disclaimer today before I ventured into this message and said we may not shout is that the spirit of the age in which we live in today is a spirit of apathy. The Bible predicted that the last day church would be apathetic in that people would lose their sense of urgency. That people would become laissez-faire when it comes to serving the Lord. Laid back. And that very few folk would be truly desperate for him. Are you with me? And we see this. We see a lackadaisical approach to God. Amen. And whatever time we spend in his presence must first and foremost be brief. And then secondly, it is not treated like it is something special. And I'm here to say today that it's time to get hungry. For the Lord. We, we can't serve the God of the Bible. Uh, just when it is. Only when it is convenient. And I've said this before. And I'll say it again. Salvation. Is not. For the passive. It's for the desperate. You got to really. Want to be saved. To make it in this day and time. Are you with me? Back to my text. It never occurred to them. That the place that the Lord held in their hearts. Would be revealed by the fact. That by their own actions. They judged him. God. Not worthy of their best. They dishonored the Lord. I have a question for you today, Upper Room. Are we guilty of dishonoring God? Have we judged that the Lord is not worthy of our best effort, our best praise? How about it? How do you think God feels about the sense of urgency that we apply to going to work versus the laid back approach we apply to attending his service. Have you ever considered whether or not God has some thoughts about that? On any road in Raleigh that you drive on Monday through Friday, in the morning going to work. Even though the traffic get jammed, everybody's aggressive trying to get to their workplace. Get up on Sunday, and you can't hardly get to church. For that same person creeping on his way to get a cup of coffee. They have nowhere to go, no set time to get there. And if they get to church and service has already started, that's all right. If they get there at all, it's all right. My question to you is this. Do you think that God notices this? Do you think that God has, that he feels something toward this the approach 
that we that we give him compared to the way we approach things that are important to us. See, when we're on our way somewhere important, we leave in plenty of time. My friends make fun of me because if I have an 8 a.m. flight, oh my, I like to get there an hour, hour and a half or so. I like to leave early, two hours. You know, you never know what may be on the highway. And see, I, I, I travel a lot. Me, me and Rock, Rocky, we were on our way. Uh, we were in, we were in uh, Sacramento, California. I preached two-night revival uh, service out there, and we're in this stretch limousine on our way to the airport. It's a good thing we left on time. We're sitting there, and we're just praising the Lord, being Clarence, and we're talking about the service, and we're on our way and on a Saturday, and boom, the tire goes out. We pull over on the side of the road, and uh, the driver gets out and calls AAA. <laughs> Wanda was my executive assistant. I text her and told her, find another flight. He's calling AAA. She texts me back, says, I've checked. That's the last flight out today. Catch that flight. He's on the phone with AAA saying, hello, hello, hello. I said, Rocket, look, we opened that trunk. Got the tire out of the trunk. Next thing I know, the police pulled up. I don't know what happened. Clance was down there working, and I'm, I'm getting out to help him. The officer saw me. I guess he thought, maybe he thought I was a, uh, I don't know what he thought. He told me, he said, Sir, you get back in the car. I said, yes, sir. <laughs> I had a suit on. I sat down. <laughs> uh, but we, point is, you know, we made it. We made it. But had we not left early enough and treated it like it was something important, I would have been stuck at the airport in, in, in uh, San Francisco. Lord God. And would have missed our Sunday morning service. At what point does God become someone important to you? Our text begins with an established moral truth that basically no one can argue with. The text says that a son honoreth his father. Bible teaches that we're to honor father and mother. The scriptures are replete with passages that teach us to honor our father and our mother. And uh, one in particular, uh, Proverbs 19 and 26 says, He that wasteth his father and chaseth away his mother is a son that causeth shame and bringeth re reproach. The word wasteth there literally means to be violent. And a son that is violent with his dad and, and uh, uh, puts his mother on the run causes shame. There is a level of respect. I didn't think I'd get a lot of amens in there. Uh, that uh, we should give to our parents. Amen. This, this notion in, the day, in this day in which we live that everybody's equal is not true. Uh, Bible says, honor, Exodus 20 and 12, honor thy father and thy mother, that thy days may be long upon the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. Isn't that right? We are to show respect. Are you with me? To our parents. Love them. Respect senior citizens. Be careful with the tone that you assume when addressing a senior citizen. Amen. Whether it's your mom or not, you ought to respect everybody's mom. 
and everybody's father. The Bible says in Ephesians 2 and 6 and 2, honor thy father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise, that it may be well with thee, and that thou mayest live long on the earth. Oh my, you want grace to come your way? Respect your parents. Honor your father and your mother. Uh, God says, a son honoreth his father. Malachi here is mirroring Isaiah. I'll preach in just a minute. But Isaiah says in Isaiah 1 and 3, the ox knoweth his owner. And the ass his master's crib. But Israel doth not know. My people doth not consider. Here the prophet uses two dumb, unreasoning animals. Two dumb beasts that lack the ability to reason to make his point. That is the dumb ox and the unreasoning mule or donkey knows his owner and they know their feeding trough. But Israel doesn't know who owns them and Israel doesn't know who feeds them. An ox and a donkey is wiser than many of us. You ought to know who it is who owns you. And you ought to know, praise the Lord, who butters your bread. And who provides bread for you. God is the one who gives seed to the sower. And provides bread to the eater. Everything we have, the Lord provided it. Somebody said, I, well I worked hard for mine. Who gave you the ability to do that? Praise the Lord. Well I, I applied my brain. Who blessed your brain to work? Oh my, any way you look at it, you can't get around the fact that the Lord has been good and, and God has allowed all of us, all of us to be the benefit of breaks and chance and opportunities. The Bible says time and chance happeneth to all. And none of us are self-made. Praise the Lord. All of us are where we are because somebody knew someone else and someone put a good word in for you. Somebody recommended you. Nobody's helped me. That's not true. Amen. Every one of us are the beneficiaries of God's grace. Amen. And, and the text says here that a son, I'm going to preach, that is a boy, a young one, a grandson, a grandchild, a descendant, a member of a group, a pupil, a subject, a disciple, somebody's favorite, a son. Doesn't have to be a biological son for this to work. Member of a group, a pupil, honoreth his father. God called Israel his son. And a servant, that is a laborer, a slave, Man in bonds, a worshiper, respects their master. So the prophet uses two groups, a son and a servant. But the truth is, saints, he was speaking to the priests. Follow me now. Follow me. The priests. If you look at what he said in verse 6. He says, a son honoreth his father, and a servant his master. If I then be a father, where is my honor? If I'm a master, where is my fear? Saith the Lord of hosts, O priests, O priests, that despise my name. The priests, the acting priests, the chief rulers, the well-known Levitical priests, the Lord was speaking to. Listen to this. The ones who are in charge of protecting the dignity and the honor of the worship service and the altar. 
Isn't it amazing that the very ones who are in charge of protecting the honor of God and the dignity of worship now are the chief offenders. Anytime you are appointed to be the standard bearer, anytime you have the assignment uh, of being the last line of defense, when you're the one, you are the guard. It's your job to guard uh, the, the house. Praise the Lord. That's responsibility. And you should take that responsibility seriously. The priests were the one in charge of protecting the worship. We see preachers and we see churches now changing what the church looks like. Instead of the church being a, a well-lit place like this church, churches now are dark. And they're putting disco lights in churches, and strobe lights. Most folk who got saved, they don't want to be reminded of the club. Amen. I, Lord saved me and brought me out of the club. I don't, I don't want to go, to go to the club now when I think I'm going to church and I end up at the club. I got saved to, to not be in the club. I don't want club church. Amen. And I said this the other day and I'll say it again. Everything about Christianity deals with the light. Jesus is the light of the world. When you get saved, you are brought to the light. When Paul got saved, he saw the light. The Bible says this, the light shineth in darkness and the darkness comprehended it not. Christianity is about light. The Bible says that which is done in the darkness during the Old Testament days, shall be brought to the light, the New Testament days. Light. Light. And this religion of light is now being represented by darkness. As the standard bearers, the very ones who should be protecting the dignity of the church are the chief offenders now in promoting this new movement of profaning the house of God. Oh yeah, we're making the church secular. I am tremendously bothered and troubled by the increase of churches that you go into church houses and there are no crosses. The church looks like everything but a church. I tell you what, hospitals look like hospitals. Hotels look like hotels. Uh, football stadiums look like football stadiums. Uh, basketball courts look like basketball courts. The baseball diamond looks like a baseball diamond. But now the church is beginning to look like something other than what it is designed to be. Especially the sanctuary. I hope that you felt when you walked in the presence of the Lord. And that you were walking into a church. Oh my, the priests were in charge of protecting the dignity, keeping a certain standard. Praise the Lord. You ought not to come before the Lord any kind of way. It's a certain standard that should be applied. And that's, it's, see, because we've judged this place special. So I want to keep it clean. We want to behave a certain kind of way. Even when sitting in the church. If, if, if the boyfriend is sitting by the girlfriend, that's still a proper way to sit in the church. The church is not a movie theater. The church is not a place where you arms all around. You look like you're ready to start giving each other a... No, you're in church. There's a, there's a certain decency in uh, there's a certain level of expectation. There's a certain level of decorum. Am I right about that? In the house of God. And the priests, the officers, the workers are the ones who are assigned to uphold these standards. The point is that the, the, the behavior of a good son and the behavior of a good priest should have been exemplified. Uh, it should have, you should have seen this in the actions of the priests. Praise the Lord. Honor is due 
to the father from his son and, and respect is due to the master or to the employer from their employees or servants. The priests, the sons of God, were indeed servants of the temple. They were the closest to the holy things. And their most essential obligation was to honor God. And they failed in that obligation. They failed. Uh, District Missionary Moles, they, they treated sacred things like they were ordinary things. I was somewhere not long ago as a church was being dedicated and the preacher who dedicated the church said that the church wasn't special. That you can't dedicate a house. The preacher made fun of uh, those churches who believe that the communion table is sacred. Amen. And, and, de and just declare that the house of God is just another place. Like any old place. That's not true. It's not true. Amen. There, are, there is such a thing as holy things. Amen. And where we gather together to, to meet the Lord at a certain time. And we hollow that place and dedicate it to, to the Lord. That makes that place special. Oh, you don't hear me today. And these priests now who were dishonoring God. Now I'll tell you what they wanted. They wanted to be treated like priests. Oh, they wanted their respect. Let the people forget to say priests. Uh, uh, excuse me, uh, Mr. Pr uh, call, let, let them call the priest a Levite. <clears throat> Wait a minute, I am a priest. <laughs> don't, get, don't get that title wrong. But now they forgot that they were supposed to protect the glory of the one who made them. So they wanted their honor, but they were not honoring the Lord. Will you bear with me for just a few more minutes? They failed to treat sacred things like they were sacred. It's, it's warming. Praise the Lord. Now, not only did they not honor God, but they despised him. Notice what the Lord says. You priests which have despised my name. To despise is to disdain. To disesteem. Instead of showing appreciation, they brought God down. It's fashionable now to preach in jeans. Open collars. Uh, flip-flops, shorts, and these things. You look like you're going on a picnic and you're standing proclaiming the word of the Lord. Try that stuff in the courtroom. The judge will lock you up for contempt of court. Thank you for watching God First with Bishop Patrick L. Wooden Sr. and the Upper Room Church of God in Christ. To experience this message in its entirety, call 877-463-3477 to purchase a DVD or CD. God First will return next week at the same time. Until then, make every day a God First day. God First.